He came to my desk with a quivering lip. The lesson was done. Dear teacher, I want a new leaf, he said. I have spoiled this one. I took the old leaf, stained and blotted, and gave him a new one, all unspotted. And into his sad eyes smiled. Do better now, my child. I went to the throne with a quivering soul. The old year was done. Dear father, hast thou a new leaf for me? I've spoiled this one. He took the old leaf, stained and blotted, and gave me a new one, all unspotted. And into my sad heart smiled. Do better now, my child. Good morning, everybody. Hey, give yourself a hand for waking up on a cold, rainy morning and coming to church. Yeah, good job. Man, Bethany and I, we, we were saying today, this is one of those days where you don't want to wake up. I mean, we actually want to wake up, right? I mean, we don't really want to not wake up. But we didn't want to wake up when we woke up. If that... <laughs> How many of you got an Alexa, like an Echo or Echo Plus or a Google Home? Anybody get one of those for Christmas? Anybody? I, I got one for Christmas. And so now I have this amazing, it's crazy. There's a woman in my life that does everything I say. <laughs> My wife was like, I know why you got Alexa, because she just, I'm like, Alexa, what time is it? And then I, I'm trying to get her to say, yes, master, but she doesn't do that. <laughs> I'm just playing. Come on. Four people left the church right there, you know. I'm just playing. I did get an Alexa, and it's great, because you can be like, Alexa, set an alarm, you know, for this time. And, and so she, today I set the alarm, and she did it. But it, it's funny, because right when you first get it, it's kind of creepy how the thing talks back to you and, and interacts, you know because it's this computer that's in your house, you know? So I'm, the, the kids, they know how to use it better than I do. They run in, they're like, Alexa, order this from Amazon for us. And we're actually in debt. We're taking up an offering today to pay for all the Amazon orders. No, I'm kidding. Um, but uh, Alexa's pretty cool. And, uh, and so, you know, I ask her questions and trivia and all kinds of fun stuff and play music and it's cool. The problem is though, we, I didn't really know how to work it at first. And so I was telling her things like her, right? It's a, it's a machine, it's a computer, but it, I was telling it, uh, her. I think Alexa's pretty sweet. Yeah, she's, she's great. She's really, really responsive. You know, it's amazing. I'm like, Alexa, um, you know, turn the light off. And so Bethany had already gone to sleep. And I, I thought, so I'd read somewhere you can whisper to it, right? Which you can, but you have to turn this mode on. I didn't turn the mode on. So I just said, Alexa, turn the light off. And she's like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Boom, the light goes off and Bethany comes out of bed. Like Alexa's yelling. I'm like, I'm so sorry. I thought, I can whisper. So then I got it figured out and I got whisper mode turned on. Have you used this? Anybody use this? It's creepy <laughs> because you're like, Alexa, turn off the light. And she goes, okay. <laughs> How many of you think it's like your dream to have something, some robot intelligence whispering to you in the dark of night? Jake. Anyways, <laughs> happy new year. Are you excited to be in 2019? It's going to be a good year. Well, I'm so excited to kick off this year and, and talk to you about what we're going, to, what we're going to talk about today. We're in this series called Clean Slate. And this series is just about the fact that we don't just serve a God of second chances, but he gives us chances, chances, chances upon chances. And our God has a merciful heart. God wants to wipe the slate clean. And, and I don't know what your background is, you know, good, bad, ugly, indifferent, whatever, uh, it doesn't matter. All of us have a story, but, but I'm here to tell you today that your past does not disqualify you from a future with God. Uh, wherever you've been, what you've done, we've all hurt people. We've all been hurt. We've all uh, d made mistakes. We've all sinned willingly. We've done things. We've been affected by the fallen world. But, but the beauty of the gospel message is that though we still re reside in a fallen world, in a fallen creation where people still get sick and there are still wars and broken relationships, but that, but that God's resurrection, life, and power has invaded this fallen world, and he's bringing a clean slate. He's, he's going to make all things new, right? 
Uh, it was in the beginning that God created all things. He made all new things and God will make all things new. And the hope of our faith is resurrection life. And so we celebrate that, this now and not yet reality that we get to be made new and have a clean slate in Christ. And yet we're still affected by sin and by this world and all the things that we go through, but we are moving towards the day when he wipes every tear from every eye. Come on. And it's, it's a fully clean slate. But I'm here to tell you today that when you engage with Jesus, when you become a follower of Jesus, when you put your trust in Jesus, that your past loses hold over you and you begin to walk in the present and the future of what God has for you, you get to have a clean slate. Really, really cool. How many of you are excited about that today? So talking about clean, how many of you are clean freaks like me? Anybody clean freaks? Love it to be clean. I don't like to clean. That's why I got Alexa, you know. Alexa, clean the house. Yes, sir. No, she doesn't do that. But um, we actually tried to get a robot vacuum and maybe that would be controlled by Alexa. That'd be cool, right? Alexa, vacuum the room. And then, I mean, this will be the future, right? Five years down the road, drones will just be flying around. They'll be in the, you know, the white throne and be like, Alexa, bring me toilet paper and a drone will come. <laughs> Anyways, let's get serious in church. Don't talk about potty in, the, in church on Sundays. Anyways, I have a bunch of little kids, so it's all, everything is bathroom humor to us right now. All the most funny jokes are about the bathroom. But I'm obsessed with clean. I love to be clean. And I, I remember when Bethany and I first got married, I had this, this habit that I'd brought from bachelorhood where I didn't, the thought of unwashed hair touching my pillow at night was disgusting to me. And I had to take a shower every night. And uh, that was what I did. You know, I was just really obsessed with being clean. And I love to be clean. I don't, I really don't like it when I get food spilled on me. I love to eat juicy food, like juicy hamburgers and hot dogs with mustard and ketchup and sauerkraut. Praise the Lord, you know, coming out of everywhere. But I, I don't want it on me. And I hate when you get like mustard on your pants or, or on your shirt. How many of you are like, I don't like that, right? I don't, do not like that. Even worse is when someone else spills their mess on you. How many of you know that's like a human rights violation? You're just there at Red Robin and then somebody's undisciplined four-year-old child. I mean, get your kid together. What's some parenting gone to these days? It's usually my kids doing this or spilling hamburgers and then the ketchup. How many, I mean, that just, it really gets me at like a deep level of anger when food gets spilled on me. And my wife, she's so sweet. She's so much better than Alexa. She, she bought me one time. She comes in and she says, Jake, you know, I got you these shout wipes. How many of you know shout wipes? It's a little tiny. Anybody have shout wipes? I'm just, this is like revelation for some people today. What did you learn at church today? There are these magical little shout wipes that will remove stains. That's what we're here to talk about. This service brought to you by shout and uh, <laughs> tied in laundry detergent. And the letter R and the number 17. We, uh, we got these shout wipes and she, she gave them to me. And at any moment, if a kid spills something on me or I get something on me, these shout wipes are kind of like magic. You can grab it and then rub it on your clothes and it makes the stain disappear. It's pretty amazing. They work really good. And then there's actually like a Tide pen, right? I don't know if they make those anymore because I'm sure teenagers were putting them in their nostrils or something. I don't know. <laughs> but the Tide pen was a very similar type of a thing where you could remove the stain. And I love that because I'm kind of obsessed with being clean. But as I was preparing for this sermon and looking into the passage that we're going to look into in the book of Mark today, I was realizing and, and that the people, the, the, the religious community of Jesus' day and age were more obsessed with cleanliness than maybe uh, I am, which is saying a lot. They were, they were obsessed with this idea of clean versus unclean. Now, it was a little bit different than the way that I'm describing with, you know, did you spill mustard on your shirt? Uh, for them, there was some religious reason. So, if you're not familiar with what this environment is, if you go back 2,000 years to first century Israel, uh, Palestine, that, that region of the world is under Roman occupation, but it's the, the nation of the Jewish people, the Hebrew nation, the Israelites. And they were obsessed with the idea of clean versus unclean, coming from the law of Moses, what they got when they came out of the, the land of Egypt as slaves, and God gave them the Ten Commandments. And some of you are familiar with Mount Sinai, and you're like, I've seen the Prince of Egypt, and you know you know, what was going to, kind of going on. And God gave them all of these commands uh, about being pure and not to eat a certain type of food. They couldn't eat shellfish and they weren't supposed to eat pork, right? No, no pig. And I'm like, those are two of my favorite foods. Come on. I would eat shrimp cooked in pork. I mean, I, and vice versa. Like, I love those kind of foods, but God said, these are unclean and don't do this. And you need to wash these things a certain way. And, 
And how many of you are a little bit, at least a little bit familiar? Those are the books of the Bible that you all avoid on the Bible reading plan. You're like, Leviticus, that's not for me. Let's skip ahead to the like wars and stuff like that. When I was a kid, I always wanted to read about wars, you know, swords and cutting people's heads off and killing giants and all that. So I would always skip those parts. But God was, was giving them all these commands about being clean versus unclean. And they, they took it to heart. And by the time of Jesus' day, they become so obsessed that they'd actually created not just following the rules that were given to them by God, but they'd actually made even barriers to keep them, rules upon rules to keep them from breaking the rules because they had a heart to uh, be pure. They had a heart to be clean. And this is what they thought that God really wanted, that God really cared about your hands and you wash them a certain way and all this kind of stuff. But at this point in history, when Jesus comes on the scene, you know, thousands of years later or hundreds of years later from the time that these laws have been placed, they've, they've added to them and it's become over 600 rules and regulations. And how many of you are like, that does not, that sounds like hell, right? It wasn't just 10 commandments. It was all of these commandments. And there were traditions and, and rules upon rules upon rules about how to be clean, how to be pure. And that's what was going on in this moment. Now, the problem with this is that people had begun to trust. These Jewish people, even well-meaning, could represent religious people even of our day that still think the same way. They'd come to trust in their capacity to keep the rules rather than the God who provided those rules and, and, and offered a pathway for relationship. They'd begun to replace the thing itself with the thing beneath. They'd sort of lost sight of the forest for the trees. And this is the, the reality that Jesus steps into where he comes on the scene. Now, that sounds very foreign to us. And yes, we don't probably understand hand washings and rituals and purification rites and, you know, bilateral suzerainty treaties and things that, are, that came from that time period. But actually the same mindset is in our culture today. And I'll explain that. But let's look into this right here in Mark chapter seven. It says in Mark chapter seven, one day, some Pharisees and teachers of religious law arrived from Jerusalem to see Jesus. They noticed that some of his disciples failed to follow the Jewish ritual of hand washing before eating. How many of you know religious people always know when you fail, right? It's like, it comes with the territory. Like on Facebook and Twitter, I'm always like, thank you, religious people, for letting me know that I failed this thing that you have laid out for me to uh, fail on. That was a better joke than you guys laughed at, but you know, it was, it was all right. We're working it through together. It says, they noticed that some of his disciples failed to follow the Jewish ritual of hand washing. It's one of these rules, one of these rules upon rules, what they need to do to be pure, to be clean, to honor God, to be right with God. Now, Mark is, a, is one of the followers of Jesus and he's writing this gospel, but it's thought to be the eyewitness account of the, the ministry of Jesus by the apostle Peter. So Peter gave this eyewitness testimony to, to, to Mark. His name is John Mark. And Mark, uh, that's why this book is called Mark, because it's Mark's account of the ministry of Jesus. And Mark actually puts a note in here for us, because we wouldn't necessarily understand the context of what's taking place here. And Mark puts this in for Gentiles or uh, people that would be outside the Jewish community that would be able to read it years later and see what was going on. And so there's parenthesis here. If you go to verse three, guys, on the screen, it says the Jews, especially the Pharisees, do not eat until they have poured water over their cupped hands as required by their ancient traditions. How many of you, the word ancient or two words, ancient traditions makes your skin crawl just a little bit? Because a lot of people think that church is like full of ancient traditions. And if you go one way or you do the wrong thing, or am I allowed to drink coffee here? Am I allowed to throw donuts at the pastor? No. <laughs> am I allowed to do this? Am I allowed to do that? And there's ancient traditions and we're afraid of stepping over the line. And so Mark is saying, hey, these are ancient traditions that they had. Similarly, they don't eat anything from the market unless they immerse their hands in water. And this is but one of many traditions they have clung to, such as their ceremonial washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. Mark is saying, listen, for those of you outside the Jewish community, you need to understand that people are, they were very obsessed with clean. They were very obsessed with what they thought God really wanted them to do and what really mattered, rather than maybe some other things that Jesus is gonna to bring to the forefront here. So it says in verse five, so the Pharisees and teachers of religious law asked him, they asked Jesus, why don't your disciples follow our age old tradition? Why are you guys doing something new? Why are you doing something different? Why are you breaking the tradition that we've set in place? Because we know this is the way, and I'm adding some things in here, but we know the way to God. We know the rules. He gave us the rules. And this is a point of contention that you see in the ministry of Jesus that 
They were surprised by him because here's a rabbi, Jesus, who grew up in Nazareth and people knew where he was from and they knew that he'd heard the same sermons that they heard in the synagogue. And they knew that he knew the law of Moses and they knew that he knew that you were supposed to wash your hands in a particular way, otherwise God would smite you. He knew what was up. And so they're like, Jesus, what are you doing? Why are you doing this new thing? Why don't your disciples, why don't your followers follow our age-old tradition. They eat first without first performing the hand-washing ceremony. Jesus, you didn't do the secret handshake. Your guys didn't give the right password to get into the club. You, you can't be a part of the religious, righteous, clean, squeaky clean, good people unless you do the secret handshake. You didn't do the secret handshake, you can't come in. So it's, that's what's being said here. with a little bit of liberty on the secret handshake part in case anyone was. And Jesus replied, you hypocrites. How many of you love being called a hypocrite? You hypocrite. Thanks, it makes me feel all warm and fuzzy on the inside. He says, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you for he wrote, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship is a farce for they teach man-made ideas as commands from God. Jesus says, for you, ignore God's law and substitute your own tradition. You ignore God's law and you substitute your own tradition. The rules you have placed above and beyond the rules that God placed, you're all mad about that. You're missing the law, but they weren't just missing the actual law or the rule. They were actually missing the entire point because they were missing the fact that the law was actually set in place to show people that they had absolutely no capacity to earn their way to God. Jesus came to explain, it says in the scriptures that he said, I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill it. In other words, to wrap it up in a bow and seal it up and say, this was the point when you understand this new thought or this reality, this is what everything was about. And he's telling them, you didn't just miss you're not just adding to it, you're missing the entire point. And he calls them hypocrites. Now the word hypocrite, we know it to mean a faker, somebody who's saying one thing, doing another, but the word hypocrite actually comes from uh, terminology used to describe actors and theater performers and they would wear masks. And so a hypocrite is one who wears a mask. And it's interesting because hypocrisy does not, is not solely the domain of Christians or want to be Christians or want to be religious people or church people or the church lady. You know, it's fun to call people hypocrites. Well, you're a hypocrite. You go to church, but you do X, Y, Z. My daughter, um, she points out my hypocrisy often. Uh, she'll be like, dad, pastors aren't supposed to say this or dad, pastors aren't supposed to get speeding tickets. And I'm like, you're absolutely right, sweetie. But pastors are real people too. <laughs> and thank God I still have, you know, still need grace and mercy. But she, she recognizes the fact that I'm being hypocritical at certain moments in my life. And she's processing it in her, her way. But a hypocrite is someone who wears a mask. And it's a picture of religion. And it's what they're doing. They're saying, I'll put on a mask and I'll perform. And if I put on this mask and I perform, then you have to accept me. And God is never interested in anything inauthentic or artificial. He doesn't want your performance. He wants your heart. In fact, God would rather take an authentic sinner than a hypocritical saint. Jesus says, he says that exact thing. And I'll think, I think we'll read this passage of scripture next week or the week after, but he says, I did not come to call those who think they are righteous, but rather to come, I came for those who know they are sinners and need a savior. Jesus would rather have you in an honest moment of need and say, I'm, I'm a mess, I'm unclean, I've got mustard on my soul. I've messed up. You done messed up, eh, a Ron? Few people will get that joke. Don't look it up. <laughs> I do not condone that, <laughs> where that joke came from. Um, but we stand before God and God says, I can work with that, with honesty. I can work with that, with the integrity to say, I don't have integrity, with the with the, the oneness of heart and the single-mindedness to come and say, God, I'm a sinner in need of a savior. And Jesus is saying, listen, guys, you're being hypocrites because you, you talk a good game. But, if, but when I look into the inside, you're wearing a mask. 
and you think that these commandments and keeping the rules and cleaning your hands, washing your hands made you clean, but washing your hands doesn't make you clean. And Jesus begins to go in and he, he just says, you've got it all wrong. And, he, and Jesus does something monumental right here. He redefines completely clean and unclean. Now, this is a bigger deal than is going to be apparent to us on the surface. And that's why Mark is trying to give us notes in here. Like, you got to understand, for everybody at this time period, the idea of clean and clean and who's in and out with God is like everybody gets it and is on the same page. That Israel is the people of God and they keep the commandments and they do the right thing. And so they're God's people and they're in with God. And the Gentiles, well, ugh, don't even get us started on those people. And they had this idea that if we do these things, if we keep these rules, if we keep these regulations and we're clean and then the other people are unclean. And Jesus says in verse 14, he says, he calls to the crowd. So he widens the audience. He's talking to Pharisees, religious leaders. He says, hey, everybody, come here. I want to tell you something. Come here, everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on over here. He gathered the crowd. It says he calls to the crowd. He says, all of you listen. He says, and try to understand Try to hear what I'm going to tell you right now, Jesus says, because he's about ready to change the paradigm. He says in verse 15, it's not what goes into your body that defiles you. You are defiled by what comes from your heart. Now that doesn't sound crazy to us because a lot of us have heard this verse before. We live in a culture that is, has been built on the foundations of a Judeo-Christian worldview through all of Western civilization. No, we're not. We're not a Christian nation. I'm not saying that. I'm saying historically, we come from a certain worldview and perspective. And so for us, the idea that what comes out of your heart, that there's an internal unseen part of us that actually puts an imprint on the physical world and it affects how we think and act, all this stuff. We're, we're, we're cognitive about that. We get that idea. But these guys wouldn't because their whole worldview is that the things around you, your external environment, if you touch a dead body or you eat shellfish or you eat pork or if you have a, a, you know, a, 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 a scab or whatever, you're now unclean. And that's what God uh, couldn't have that unclean. And they have this very rigid con conception and idea of clean versus unclean. And Jesus in one sentence completely inverts that and changes the whole paradigm. He says, it's not what comes into you that defiles you. It's what comes out of your heart. And then he says, and then he drops the mic and he goes away. It says in verse 17, then Jesus went into a house to get away from the crowd. Do you know why he did that? Because people were like, what? It'd be like if I walked in here today and said, you guys, I'm from Mars. See you later. You know, luckily in here, it would take me so long to get out, you know, <laughs> very awkward. We, Joy Medford, when I was growing up, one time a lady was in the service and she was offended and she tried to leave. And so she went to the nearest exit, which happened to be a closet. <laughs> so she <laughs> indignantly rose from the pew and wrenched open the door and stepped inside and slammed the door. <laughs> and then she came out and made her way. <laughs> but Jesus makes a hasty exit. Why? Because he's dropping a bomb. He's saying everything that you think, everything that you think about religion, everything you think about clean versus unclean, you guys, is all, is all wrong and you're hypocrites. And they're like, what? But he goes into the house to get away from the crowd and his disciples asked him what he meant. Jesus, what the heck are you talking about? Verse 18, he says, don't you understand either, he said? Can't you see that the food you put into your body cannot defile you? Praise the Lord. How many of you are thankful we could eat shrimp? <laughs> Jesus, come on. Give me some of those pork uh, carnitas, come on. Verse 19, food doesn't go into your heart but only passes through the stomach. Jesus didn't know 21st century science. We do know now that food actually does go into your heart. If you're eating like exclusively Funyuns, you're probably gonna die soon. <laughs> but that's not what he means. He says, food doesn't go into your heart, but only passes through the stomach and then goes into the sewer. And we understand how that process works. I won't go into that. My five-year-old would love me to explain all the intricacies of that process. And then Mark makes a note for us. By saying this, he declared that every kind of food is acceptable in God's eyes. In other words, guys, it's not about the hand washing. It's not about the food that you eat. He goes on in verse 20, it is what comes from inside that defiles you. It is what comes from inside. For from within, out of a person's heart come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, deceit, lustful desires, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. It's like a description of a new Netflix drama. <clears throat> You ever watch, you're like, this looks interesting. Nope, 
Nope. Verse 23, all these vile things come from within. They are what defile you. So what does Jesus do? He completely turns it around. He says, listen, your religion, this idea that you have imposed upon what God was actually saying all along, but what you have taken it to mean is that it's the outside world that has a problem. And Jesus says, actually, all along, it's always been the inside that has a problem. And he moves the target from the outside world to the inside world. Now, it doesn't mean that things we do in our life, when we sin, when we do wrong things, unclean things, it doesn't mean that they're not wrong. Jesus isn't saying that. What he's saying is the source of the symptom is not the food that you ate. It's the heart that walks around inside of your body at all times. And though you look like on the outside, like these Pharisees who are hypocritical, they wear the mask of, hey, I'm good with God. I'm clean. I'm okay because I've kept the rules and all of this. Actually, all of us have a rotten heart. Jesus is saying the real problem is at the heart level. Now, I know I said that Jesus was doing a new thing and Jesus was bringing a new message, but actually God had been giving them hints and, and speaking to them about this all through the Old Covenant and Old Testament. In Proverbs chapter 20, this is you know hundreds of years before the time of Christ. It says, who can say, I have made my heart clean, I am pure from sin? This is a rhetorical question because the answer to that is nobody can. Nobody can say, I've made my heart clean. How do you clean your heart? There's no shot wipe for that. When you wrong someone, when you, when you curse somebody, when you have anger at someone, when you are lustful, when you're greedy, when you're envious, you can't wipe it away. There's a stain on your heart, on your soul. Jeremiah 17, 9, the prophet Jeremiah says, the human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? Again, another rhetorical question nobody knows. It's like dropping a coin down a well and you never hear it hit the bottom. We don't really know the depth of the depravity because the reality is that apart from God, we're spiritually dead. There is no spectrum of righteous or unrighteous, clean or unclean. The spectrum is either in Christ and you're alive or you're out of Christ and you're dead. And so Jesus is saying, guys, it's been in here all along. We had all the laws and everything, but you got to understand you were missing it all along. The law was to teach you that you could never earn. You could never really be up to snuff of where God was. And so we come to the crux of the issue. And what's fascinating to me is that we live in a culture that is every bit as religious as this culture of Jesus' time. Now, we don't have a temple that we go to and we don't have, um, you know, hand-washing ceremonies unless you're like really have a problem with cleanliness and OCD and you're like, you know, the person that carries around like six gallons of hand sanitizer. You're basically like a walking napalm bomb, you know, if something happened because you have so much hand sanitizer around. For me, it's my hair. If anybody ever brought a light around, just woof, you know, it's too much <laughs> hair product. But we're still living like the Pharisees because what, we're, what, what a lot of people do is this is our mindset is like, I'm basically good on the inside. And yeah, I've done some bad stuff. I've made some mistakes. But if I say I'm sorry and I kind of, you know, maybe try to make amends or whatever, then I'm back into the good graces of God and I'm, everything's good. The bad stuff's over here. It's outside of me, but the good stuff's on the inside. And I'm always working my way back to kind of being clean. Jesus says, hold on a second. That's actually the opposite of what's true, that the inside of you is wrong and bad. And there's nothing you can do out here to make that part clean. You can scrub yourself all the time. And what do people do to scrub themselves? Well, I go to church every single week and I give in the offering and I, I lead a joy group and I do this and I do that. And I, I, I don't watch these kind of shows. And I, there's nothing wrong with any of that. What's wrong with it is that it's starting from a flawed idea and premise that you can never do anything about your sin apart from God. You see, Jesus was just getting them to take a hard look at this and he wants to get us to take a hard look at this. You can still be as religious and never go to church. You can still be religious and never darken the door of Joy Church, never, never be a part of anything that looks outwardly religious. But if you're still trying to clean yourself up to earn a place with God, or you're trying to pay for your own sins, you're still worried about washing your hands. And Jesus wants you to know you can scrub those hands until there's no more skin on them, but the real stain is a little bit deeper. It's the heart. And there's only one substance that can purify a wicked and sinful heart. And that's the blood of the sinless, spotless Lamb of God, Jesus, who gave his life on a cross 2,000 years ago, who, who died. And his purity and perfection was poured out 
that any rotten sinner like me or you could come to the foot of the cross and let him cleanse us from the inside out. And that's the beauty and simplicity of the gospel. The radical message of Jesus was then and is today this right here, that only God can deal with your sin and give you a clean slate. You see, the beautiful thing about what we're talking about with clean slate with this series is that God literally wants to wash away your sin. All through the scriptures, Old Testament and New, you see the heart of God to, to take your sins and bring them as far away as the East is from the West, to not punish us, to show us mercy. God gives every opportunity. He's pleading and saying, hey, I wanna help you with your real problem. But we have to, we have to drop the act and stop saying, I'm, I'm good on my own, or I'll figure it out, or I just need another chance and then I won't make mistakes anymore, God, and then you'll accept me. No, you're never gonna get it right. But when you let Jesus begin to change you from the inside out, you're right with God in that moment from then forward. In Isaiah 1, verse 18, the prophet Isaiah speaks the word of God to the people of Israel. He says, come, let's settle this, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, I will make them as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, I'll make them as white as wool. This stain that he's talking about, the scarlet, was like they would dip these robes into this rich, vibrant dye. And once it was dipped, it could never be un, undone. And how many of you feel like your life is like that? That, that you, you've, made some, you've done some things, you've gone into some situations, you've been in you know, that relationship or with those people, or you put that thing into your blood system, your bloodstream, and you've done something that now is a part of you. It's like you're intrinsically linked with your sin and with your shame and you carry it around. And what God is saying to us today is, listen, though your sins are like scarlet, though you are irreparably damaged by what you've done and where you've gone and whatever you've been done it with, I'm gonna baptize you in something pure and beautiful and you're gonna come out brand new the stain of sin, they don't make a shout wipe for it. I'd love that, right? Ooh, I said this bad word and I can just take a spiritual shout wipe and whoop. Doesn't work like that though. Romans 5, the apostle Paul, he was like a Jew of Jews. He was like a Hebrew of Hebrews. He said, man, I know everything about the law. This guy grew up, he had every, you know, little sentence memorized. He knew it, he had it all dialed in. He was so sure and confident in his, in his capacity to understand how to operate with God. And God had to wreck him, literally uh, shock him into salvation, like arrest him on the road to Damascus and like shine in a bright light and say, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And so Saul becomes this guy, Paul, and he has this massive transformation. And he writes these words. He says, when we were utterly helpless, this is coming from a man who knew everything he needed to do to be right with God. But he came to this place of understanding that we are utterly helpless that's the, that's the entrance point to the gospel. That's the entrance point to the kingdom of God. Not, I contribute, you know, God does his part, I do my part. No, that's speaking like a good American, but it's not speaking like a person who's a part of the kingdom of God. Jesus says, you have to be like a little child. Well, God helps them that helps themselves. That's not in the scripture. First book of Hesitations 2.4. It's not even, it's not, it doesn't exist. Yeah, be self-sufficient, learn how to, you know, get a job and work for yours, whatever. But when it comes to salvation, you have to be completely and utterly helpless. Jesus can't save you if you're trying to help him. You know, when, when they do rescue uh, shows and they talk about the guys, that, the rescue divers that jump into the water, one of the most dangerous things is when the person who's being saved tries to help save themselves. That's when the most trouble comes. You know, it's exactly the same in spiritual things. When Jesus jumps out of the helicopter and comes into the water and you're fighting him like, I can swim. <laughs> Looks like it. <laughs> but listen, when you just say, look, I'm utterly helpless. It says Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. In, verse, in Titus 3, 5, the apostle Paul writes these words. He says, he saved us, not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy, he washed away our sins. How many of you wanna have Jesus wash away your sins? Not be sitting there with the shout wipe, you know, working on yourself all the time, trying to, you know, look pretty to go to church on Sundays, but actually Jesus to wash away your sins, like actually take care of the problem, giving us a new birth and a new life through the Holy Spirit. That's the dividing line. The reality of the gospel is that we either trust in ourselves and our own goodness, even if it's just 1% out of 100 or something, 
or we 100% trust in Jesus and say, I was utterly helpless. I am utterly helpless. I'm incapable. My sins are like scarlet, but he wants to wash me white as snow. And listen, maybe you're here today and you're like, well, I'm already a Christian. But if you're sitting here today, and I, I fall into this trap a lot, so I'm not preaching to you. I'm preaching to myself. If you're sitting here today and you're thinking, well, yeah, but I've learned some things in life. So now basically here's how I contribute to this process of salvation. You might want to re-examine that and think about it, that the beauty of the gospel is that you don't ever graduate from this place of 100% standing by faith in the grace of God. There's never a moment when you graduate to like, now I'm kind of like Christian 1.0, Christian 2.0, and now, now it's me 2% and God 98%. <laughs> no, it doesn't mean that God doesn't have things for you to do. It doesn't mean that you're not going to work hard and serve him and do great things. And that God is, it doesn't mean he's not working a process of sanctification in your life where you are going to think differently and make better decisions, but it's about salvation. When we talk about the actual problem of sin, that we're sinners in need of a savior, there's never a day when you're not still needing that savior to save you. And guess what? When you admit that and when you accept that reality, it changes everything. You have a clean slate and now you can walk in the freedom that, that grace provides. And what's amazing about this is when you walk in that freedom, it actually does change your behavior. And you don't want the things you used to want and you want to walk righteous. And there are no sinners in the presence of God. I want you to understand something here because you might be hearing me say, well, that means we're always sinners and we'll never break free. Actually, when you're saved, you're now not a sinner in the eyes of God. You're a saint. You're a son or daughter. You're washed, redeemed, cleaned, and you stand spotless in the presence of God. And God is working out something in the temporal reality that will be finally realized at resurrection when glory comes. But what, is, but what has happened is you have now become positionally righteous and justified. And justified means this, just as if I'd never sinned. And when God looks at you, he doesn't see your past. He sees your present and your future. And he sees who he made you to be. And most of all, he sees Jesus. And he says, in you, I am well pleased. And it's that thought and that reality that we walk in. Come on, let's give glory to God today. Thank you, Lord. When we walk in that reality that we actually get free from sin, but it's not when we're sitting here with shout wipes trying to clean ourselves. It's when we say, Jesus, I need you to wash me, to purify me, to clean me and give me a clean slate. This morning, if you're here and you don't follow Jesus currently. You're not a, a Christian. You don't even maybe think of yourself like that's something you'd even want to be or do. I'm not asking you to like commit to, you know, do anything. But what I want to invite you to do is to, to, to admit that you're a sinner in need of a savior. And if you're a Christian here today, you prayed a sinner's prayer and you've done this before, maybe you're like, I need to believe in that gospel. I need to receive Jesus in that mindset that he does it all. But if that's you today and you want to, you want to give your life to Jesus, you want to put your trust in him, you want to get a clean slate before God. You can stop all the effort and all of that. You can stop all the striving and you can just trust in Jesus. And if you call upon his name, you're gonna be saved. And I wanna invite you to just make that commitment today. Would you just pray with me? If that's you, just pray this prayer with me together and just mean it, be sincere. Dear Jesus, I confess my sin to you. I know that I've, I've sinned. I know I have a stain on my soul. And I know that I'm powerless to wash it. I'm unclean before you. But I thank you that you gave your life. That you can wash away my sins. I receive you today as my Lord and Savior. And I put all my hope and trust in you. And in you alone. In Jesus' name. Amen.